Hello everyone, Lauren Wild here. Today we are going to be talking about shamanic witchcraft. So we're going to talk about all different kinds of witchcraft, different kinds of witchcraft practices, ways that people um, go down particular lines or um, you know where people settle in their craft. So what we're pulling from is my signature program called Ancestral Witch. So I do have an entire program that is dedicated to ancestral witchcraft because it's an entire path, right? Um, and so this is just a taste of that. And it is hopefully to help kind of like wet your whistle. And if next year, you know, you want to keep going and you're interested in the ancestral piece then and the shamanic piece, then it could be a great option for you at some point. You may have even already taken it. And if so, then this is like a little bit of a refresher. So let's go ahead and dive in. So the first thing we want to talk about is the shamanic cosmology and a little bit of the differences between um, being a shamanic practitioner, being a priestess and a witch. All right. Because in these teachings that I'm teaching you, all three of those archetypes are combined. All right. Now they can live separately on their own. Um, in my mind, they kind of all overlap on top of each other in the way that my ancestors channeled these teachings to me that I'm going to share with you. And then my teachers taught to me. And then my ancestor or Ellen of the ways, I'm not exactly sure who, but some sort of spiritual being told me about this and I downloaded it. And that was in 2019, in November of 2019. This came to me through a channeled vision and message. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So the first thing we wanna talk about is shamanic cosmology. So um, I follow Celtic, Welsh and Nordic shamanic principles. So it's important to understand that shaman is a very, very, very old term, and it particularly comes from Siberia, all right? So um, a lot of times when we hear shaman, we tend to think of the coranderos and coranderos in Peru um, and like Peruvian, uh, Hispanic, and like um, South American kind of um, spiritual practitioners, shamans, maybe like in a hut in Africa, right? Like people kind of have these like correlations with shamans in their mind. However, what a shamanic practitioner is, is quite um, different in the neo-shamanic era. All right. Now, if you're ever interested or worried about being appropriative, the fastest way to deal with that is by, um, instead of calling yourself a shaman, you can say you're a shamanic practitioner. Um, however, almost every single culture has a type of shaman that goes through the name of their their culture and their language. So in Ireland, it's a shabian um, or a shaman. So it, it looks like sea bean, <laughs> right? In um, the Nordic tradition, it's a Voluspa, which is a seer um, or a satyr practitioner, which satyr is the shamanic practice that was shared by Freya. Um, which I have a whole class on that if you haven't watched that yet. Um, or if you're interested in watching that, I do have a whole class on on Freya and Seder, um, just like an introductory. But those are some of the pieces. And then one of the other big, big, big pieces that I pull from is from Ellen of the Ways, who is the dear goddess in Welsh teachings. And her particular teachings are about the ley lines in the earth and certain pathways that we're meant to follow. So she's very much a um, shamanic goddess um, that's, she has deer antlers. She literally lives in the woods and she holds a big lantern and lights the way for your path. And a lot of shaman shamanism is tied to path walking or journeying, right? So um, that's one of the things that I wanna share is that I particularly am sharing European shamanism with you because I'm not Peruvian, you know, that's not my lineage. And um, my goal, especially working with ancestry, is to be a guide and an illuminator in the ancestral pieces that you could be tied to. Now, that is not to say that you can't get called into Native American shamanism. You may. However, you know, like I, when I left Christianity, I started to get called to shamanism. 
I didn't even know I was getting called to shamanism. I had no idea what I was being drawn into. Um, and I went to Native American shamanism because that's the only kind of shamanism I knew. And it's beautiful. Their wheel is different than the European shamanic wheel. They are incredibly um, like synchronistic. Almost all shamanic perspectives are synchronistic because they're a certain pathway that all of these different cultures were downloading and picking up on. They're extremely animistic. Um, they're extremely mystical. They, in, they involve altered states and gaining information from another realm, whether that is bringing the energy towards you or if that is journeying out to the others. So there's a lot of different kinds of ways to be a shamanic practitioner. I want you to know that. Um, but I also want you to know that I am sharing European shamanism because that is my ancestry, right? Anything beyond that, I would be not initiated in and um, I'd be appropriating, right? So what I'm interested in is giving you a lot of information so that you can do the research and you can go down these lines. Now, we want to talk for a minute about, you know, some of the cosmology of shamanism because it is across the board and then some of the different ways to practice it. So the first thing about shamanic cosmology that's across the board in all shamanic practices is this idea that there is an upper world a middle earth and a lower world. So the upper world has lots of different names. The lower world can have lots of different names. And then the middle world is what we call Midgard in, um, in Nordic shamanism. So middle earth, we exist here in middle earth. Now in almost every shamanic um, teaching, it is very much like there is spiritual realm above us, like the celestial, the heavens. And then there is the underworld below us. And then there's all the elements around us. And then there's all the spirit beings around us. And then there's like celestial beings around us. And then, and then beyond that, there's other worlds. There's other realities. There's other timelines. So it is very specific in the way that it thinks. It is a very, um, it, in, in common, like in modern day language, what we call it is um, quantum physics. Okay. So shamans have picked up on quantum physics thousands of years before uh, physicists started naming things quantum, right? Quantum entanglement, that, you know, there's these metaphysical realities, that there's multiple timelines existing, that time is just a construct, time is a fabric, all of those things. Shamans have known that forever because they're brilliant and they're deeply tied to um, the human mind, the human body, the earth, the earth's body, and they're deeply tied to all of the energy around them, all right? Now, it's important to understand that in order for a person to be shamanic and um, and not lose their minds, right? Not become ungrounded. It's important that you understand what it feels like in your body to be in the upper world, what it feels like to be in the lower world, what it feels like to be in Midgard, and what it feels like to be disembodied. Because I tend to work with a lot of people that are highly spiritual beings, um, whether they're shamanic, um, channelers, mediums, empaths, it doesn't matter. It means that you have to be excellent about understanding what is me, what is my field, what's home base for me, what's neutral ground, where is my Midgard, where's my north, where's my east, where's my south, where's my west, where's me, right? Because if not, you can get lost. These teachings are extremely big. Like they can just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can kind of like drown in the soup of information. Um, and we don't want that. Okay. We don't want that. We, we want digestible things that make sense. All right. So it's important to understand that the type of, the not astrology, but the type of shamanism that I'm teaching you particularly through my lens is ancestral. So what we're looking for is what we call the well-line ancestor and the blood bank of magic, all right? So your well-line ancestor is an ancestor that really wants to work with you, has probably been around you your whole life and has been dead at least 400 years, okay? Past slavery. So what we're looking for when we journey is to pick up that ancestor and to hopefully bring them back. And if not, just establish communication. How are they talking to you? How are they trying to build a relationship with you? How can you build a relationship with them? What can you petition them to help you with? 
And then what line did they come from? All right. Which we'll talk about that once we get to the pillars that um, that were taught to me. All right. So that being said, um, that's the first piece you want to understand is that the ancestral witchcraft lens is to journey out to find the ancestor, to bring the ancestor back, and then to start to tap into what my teacher, Daniel Dolsky, taught me, which is called a blood bank of magic. So you have ancestors that worshipped something, you know, probably land-based about 400, 500 years ago, that you have immediate access to. It's like finding out that you won the lottery or that your ancestors were really, really, really rich, and you all of a sudden have access to them. There are these banks and wells of ancestral knowledge that you can download and that you can conscript into service. You can ask them to help you. You can ask them to open doors for you. You can ask them to protect you and they will. There's power in the blood, right? Not to sound like Christian, but there's power in ancestry, all right? The next piece that's really important in this particular work is what we call the thread or the sutra, the golden cord. The, the work that we're going to pull on, the thread that we're going to pull on, like when you get to a certain thing and it's like juicy and it's the same topic and maybe it's like worthlessness, right? Um, and you see it like everywhere you look, you're just like, oh, worthlessness or like um, criticism, right? Or um, disembodiment, whatever it is, like every season, I always have a different thread that gets pulled on pretty much. Um, but what we're always looking for is what we call the sutra, the golden thread. The thing that like, if we pulled on the string and like, we just kept going, we would see like almost every problem we're dealing with is like all rooted into this one thread. That's what we call the sutra um, or the thread that we pull on. That's all we're looking for. One direction, one ancestor, one thread. That's all we really have energy for in one season. The season is really... Um, about four months long and the best time of the year to do it is from autumn equinox to winter solstice okay um, that is when the veil is the thinnest that is when our ancestors are the most active that is when we are able to do more spirit communication than any other time in the year okay and that's in the northern hemisphere of course so um, it's important to understand that you already have a bunch of spirits around you. You've already got a bunch of guides around you. Not all of them are your ancestors. Probably most of them are not. Um, and when we do have a lot of ancestors, usually they're recently dead and they haven't been dead long enough to stop caring about things that they cared about when they were humans, right? So we're looking for the ones that are very, very dead and are going to help us with your sutra, your thread, all right, your golden cord. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. The next layer that we get into in the next part of the process is lineage restoration and repair. So it's important to understand, it is not necessarily our job to heal our racist ancestors past, right? Like it's just, it's not, but the racism doesn't die with them. It goes down the generational lines and it ends up in us and our children and our children's children. So what we're doing in ancestral lineage repair work is repairing ourselves. We are pulling on those threads and maybe one of your ancestors was like, we can never rest because if we rest, we're going to die. And somehow, some way, that narrative gets all the way down into your lineage. And then you see your own child doing it, right? That is what we are working on is by you becoming cognizant of that story, of that thread, then that becomes the sacred work for you in the season, the shadow work focus for you in the season so that you can heal that within yourself. Not them, not your children. That's their own journey, yourself. Because once we start to model these healed behaviors to our children, it allows our children to heal too, all right? So um, this is heavy work. Um, the more that I do my work, the more that I realize like this is the work, like it, it, it is the work. Um, we are basically our own unique consciousness, but our bodies are basically the, uh, four generations before us. We're basically just a mixture of their trauma, their cells. Um, and yeah, like our own consciousness, right. With our own challenges. So it's important to understand that like, at the end of the day, that's what I'm always trying to really do in the ancestral witch lineage work. 
Now, depending on if you're actually doing Ancestral Witch or if you are um, like in one of my programs and then there's just like a section of the Ancestral Witch teachings, either one, it's important to understand that that's the work and you could do this work every single year for the rest of your life. Like there is infinite lines, lanes, lifetimes, like this kind of work can be done forever. But where's the fun in that, right? So everything needs light and dark. They need balance. And so I really encourage doing the heavy, um, particularly like the information gathering work really during the dark part of the year. And then the lineage repair work really during the bright part of the year. Okay. So I'll leave that where that is. Now, let's talk really quickly about some of the different differentiation points between shamans, uh, priestesses, and witches. So shamans are very animistic. They're very mystical. Everything comes from the shamanic cosmology. There's Midgard, upper world, lower world, multiple worlds around us, multiple timelines. It's quantum in its theory. All right. It's spiritual focus is tied. It's animistic, meaning everything has consciousness. Everything has life force. And it is usually known as great spirit. OK, it is significantly more village focused. Its spiritual practices can be extremely ritualistic in the sense that it's the same every time. But usually um, the shamanic practitioner is more instinctual, intuitive versus um, being like extremely like almost like a litanist, you know, like going through the same routine every single time. So it's it's very like what the the shamanic person is feeling and channels it out and then heals. Like there's always an aspect of the spiritual healer and the spiritual direction, um, like advisor in the community that is tied to shamanism. Okay. One of the other things that really creates a differentiation point between shamanism, witchcraft, and priestesshood is that shamanism requires altered states, whether that's through working with plant medicines, um, trance work, um, ecstatic dance, uh, breath work, um, fasting in the woods for days at a time. Like regardless, there's always an aspect of an altered state involved um, with shamans. Okay. All right. Now our next category is the priestess. So the priestess archetype is more, um, formal in the sense that it is like priest priestess. There is usually some sort of like ritual that is done a certain way. And the priestess is meant to guide and lead and serve its spiritual community. It has way more structure to it. It's not so much about like divination and oracular meanings. Um, it can be priestess is very open, but usually the most basic understanding of a priestess is a female identified spiritual leader in service to some sort of spiritual agenda, right? Um, and then in that, they really like take the lead in um, running the rituals, in holding the ritual ceremonies, they tend to be more so in like high magic and pagan communities. Um, but there's a priestess of like all kinds of things. But it it is a little bit more orderly. And there usually is some sense of a procession that is happening and a spiritual community that you are in service to. Okay. And then, and like priestess is like such a, like a, a kind of like a coverall for, um, a female identified person in spiritual service. Okay. And then the witch is, is different because the witch is first of all, not a religious path. Um, like the other three or the other two are not religious paths. They are archetypes of feminine service. Um, but the difference between the witch is that the witch is not correlated to any particular religion. And usually there is some aspect of uh, rebellion that's necessary and it's very tied into self-empowerment okay whereas if you look at like the priestess usually the priestess is like a spiritual person in service to maybe like Bridget or to the goddess or to the Morrigan right whereas a witch is really like at the end of the day 
it's focused on sovereignty. Okay. It is focused on like, I am, um, I'm powerful on my own. I'm sovereign on my own. There's always a level of rebellion tied to the witchcraft um, archetype. And then one of the other pieces that's tied to the witchcraft archetype is um, being outcasted and the witch wound. So like being misunderstood, um, very much like being scapegoated as like the bad person, right? Um, it can correlate to like a Jezebel, you know, kind of archetype too, but which is a very large archetype that is really tied to the concept of a person. It does not have to be a female identified person to be a witch. Okay. And that's choice. Like some people are like, well, I'm a warlock and I'm like, cool. Um, but male identified people can be witches too. And non, um, non-binary, uh, people can be considered a witch too. It's not just female identified folks, okay? Um, it's important that the witch community really honors and upholds that, in my opinion, in the age of Aquarius, for sure. So um, one of the things that does really separate witches is that witches are very closely tied to the cycles of the seasons and the moon. Um, and it's tied to witchcraft, which means that there's some sort of like spell practice usually in their work that is tied to like manifestation, wanting an outcome whereas like shamanism is really more so about like healing right um whereas we're when we're getting into witchcraft it's like usually there's a focus there's a focus of the craft um whether that's ancestry whether that is spellcraft whether that is herbalism it doesn't matter okay um witchcraft always has some sense of a craft at the center of its practice okay um but remember like the big piece is self-empowerment now, witches can exist in covens, and um, witches have a very historical aspect to them that the others don't, and that is where the witch wound comes from. And that is being misunderstood, scapegoated by a community, pushed out on the outside of the community, um, and then also knowing things that people don't know how you know. So the witch is also tied to things like divination, seeing, mediumship, clairvoyance, um, now there are just like, there is an archetype of the medium. There is an archetype of the channel. There is an archetype of the CRS. Like there are these little micro understandings of essentially the largest, you know, um, archetype in my opinion, through kind of like this, witch wild woman lens is going to be like a wild feminine archetype. Okay. Now just divine feminine archetypes kind of fall into the line of a multitude of things. And usually you'll hear it say like goddess circles or something like that versus like a coven. Um, that is very much like divine feminine. I have worked very hard to create a major distinction in this school, wild spirit school, that it is a wild feminine spiritual principle school. We are not super focused on like, you know, the light and love community. Like there's enough of those out there. We are focused on these more um isolated and um uh, ostracized understandings of feminine service right now priestess covers everything like i said like it really does it covers everything um but like channel medium guide psychic clairvoyant um they're kind of like in that gray area uh in regards to divine feminine rising in honest truth i am in service to the divine feminine rising right like I want to see the feminine rise. It doesn't matter if there's like, you know, goddess circles and then like witch circles and like the wild feminine. That's just the caveat that I know best as a teacher and I want to focus on. That feels like my dharma because my north node is in Taurus conjunct black moon Lilith. I'm here to teach sovereignty, right? So um, it's not that I'm not open to those things. It's just, that's not my lane, right? So if you know that you're really drawn to like that goddess archetype, that light worker archetype, all of that, that's totally fine. They are just a little bit more like culturally appropriate or culturally acceptable, right? And so they don't necessarily fall under the wild feminine lens. And some people might argue that it does because they've been ostracized because of those words cool. Like everybody's perception is their own. I'm, I do not know everything about this. I am willing to be taught 
that I don't, <laughs> right? So, um, but those are important things that you need to understand is some distinctions, all right? Now, the next thing that's really important to understand with shamanic witchcraft is understanding the directions and knowing how to cast your directions and then um, like which line is pulling you when you went on your journey, was it the North Star, East Star, South Star, West Star? Like which star pulled you? What were the information pieces that you were given? And if you haven't gone on your journey yet, that's okay. But you do need to do your journey before you can really jump into anything. You have to go on your first journey, okay? So, so you can get the information that you need. And it takes about 45 minutes to an hour. And you want to make sure you don't drive or go anywhere for at least two hours after um, so that you can like process it, Okay. Um, but it is extremely important to understand that those pieces go with you. All right. Um, and, and they're a part of the whole process. So the next piece that's really important is your altar. Your altar is of extreme importance in ancestral witchcraft work because your altar works as a threshold. So when you create this altar, you've got a candle on it which represents like your on and off sign to the spirit world. And what it does is it creates a space for spirit communication to happen in only one place in one time when your candle is lit. Now, one of the things that I teach my like ancestral witch students proper is um, get some sort of apparatus or like a piece of furniture that has doors that open and close like a China cabinet you know, like doors that open and close. Now I do ancestral witch for a living. So my ancestral witch altar is like right there, right? I have another big altar right behind my, I mean, I have altars everywhere. I'm a witch for a living, literally. So like, it doesn't bother me. Um, but my ancestors are right here. I keep food and offerings lit over there all the time. As a matter of fact, I owe them one because I get the sense that they're like, feed me. Um, but here's the thing. You, a huge part of the work that you do during um, this time of the year is um, spell crafting, witch crafting, and offerings and petitions. So your altar is extremely important in this work. So you need a piece of furniture that is set aside specifically for your witchcraft. All right. It is important. If you cannot do that, then you need to let me know so that we can find a way for you to be able to do it. If you need a traveling altar because you travel a lot, that's okay, but you need to let me know, okay, so that we can make sure that you're ready um, to be able to do this work because, especially during the dark part of the year, because they know you from your altar. This is where they see the light. They may hear you drumming or singing or smell the coffee that you put out for them, whatever it is, and that's where they meet you. And if you're traveling all the time, they can get really confused. Like they're not omniscient beings. They're not angels. Like they're dead, you know? So um, they can get, they can get lost. They can lose you. Not forever. They'll eventually find you. But like, if you're going just like on a vacation for the weekend, you want to find a way to kind of like take them with you or let them know I'm going to be gone for the next couple of days and I'll be back on Monday. You know, um, I tell all my spirits, like I do, I, I sit in front of all my altars. I let them know, like, at nighttime, when I leave my office and I turn my lights off and everything, I say, good night spirits. Thanks for the day. Like, you know, I, I let them know that I, I appreciate them. They're with me. And I know that. Okay. Um, so it is important to understand that all of these aspects involve spirit communication and mediumship. All right. It is the closest offering that I have that teaches you how to use your clairvoyant gifts your clairsentience, um, to awaken like your psychic gifts and your mediumship gifts, because not everybody can medium, not everybody can channel and not everybody can be an intermediary, meaning you can channel and medium. So I'm an, I am an intermediary. However, um, if I'm doing a lot of this work and I'm channeling a lot, it can be harder for me to get to the, the frequency of the dead uh, because channels require your frequency to be very high, depending on who you're channeling. And then mediumship requires you to be able to drop your frequency down to earth level. And so we'll learn that as we get into the teachings. Um, but it is important you understand your altar is super important. All right. So let me go ahead and share the screen 
so that I can um, show you this. All right, so like I just said, um, we alters are the anchor point between the worlds. Um, alters serve as a bridge between the 3D human world and the world of the dead. Learning how to set boundaries and signs that you're open and closed are deeply important to the relationship and personal energy. Ancestors and spirits need boundaries as much as humans do, if not more. They're dead. They don't know. <laughs> you have to tell them. Um, so you need a physical altar, hopefully not in your bedroom. I did have mine in my bedroom last year. It was fine. Um, but they will keep you up if you're, if you're not really good about like your on sign, your off sign, letting them know that you're not ready to talk. Um, you need a candle during this work that signifies communication. So this is a candle that you're going to light, um, every single time that you're wanting to communicate. And then you're going to snuff out when you do not want to communicate. You need a distinctive threshold marker, like a broom or keys. So something that um, you really like know, like when it's out, it's it's like, it means that you can talk to me or you cannot. The same kind of thing is this open, closed sign and hours of operation kind of situation. And that is like lighting your candle or closing your door and opening your door. Now, eventually we want to get to the place where we have really well-lined spirits that are with us all the time. We don't send them away, but they're not super talkative. They're just very protective. Um, so I have like different kinds of ancestors at this point, particularly my male ancestors, they are perimeter keepers. So they stay on the outside of my house or at least like 50 yards away from me. And they're always running perimeter around my house and myself. So, and I send them to go watch over my kids pretty often as well, but my kids have their own ancestral protection. So, um, they, you, you want to be able to keep them with you at all times. Eventually the ones that are really well dead and don't have a personal agenda that they want you to complete for them. Okay. So we need to establish the well-line ancestors versus the recent dead and deity and the difference between well-line ancestor altars and lineage repair altars. We'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, um, you're, you need to feed them and use your candles. You'll establish the things that they like and might have attachments to using colors, symbols, smells, and food. And then once you feed them, they start to become more real. They become physically more embodied. They have more energy behind them. Ask them to give you clear signs, ask them to tell you their names, to give them timelines, um, tell them stories, ask them to tell you stories, speak their prayers and do their rituals. Okay. That's a really interesting one, especially if you have, um, any ancestors that are highly like religious, that means they're not been dead long enough. Okay. Um, so this is where we are right here. Um, and that is the healing, the healing and story gathering is best in the light part of the year which is what we're just, you know, um, in between winter solstice and summer solstice and the dark part of the year is between summer solstice and winter solstice. This is where we meet the ghosts of our ancestors and feel their wounds the most easily in fall. Okay, so here's some elemental alchemy. These are all the elements that are needed on your altar or your table. All right, so the first one is earth. This right here is the glyph for earth, a downward facing triangle with a line through it. Some examples would be literally dirt from like your land, um, a pentacle, right? Like a, you can order them on like Etsy, a crystal, plants, and money. Like those, that's very earth elementy, like coins. Water, this is important. You wanna keep a clean, fresh cup of water on your altar at all times. A shell works too. But during this work, it's imperative that you keep a clear, um, clean, fresh of water or clean cup of water. Keep it fresh. I change it once every week. I put it in my calendar to make sure that I'm making food offerings at least once a week and keeping the water bowl clean. <laughs> it's important. All right. They care. The more that they have, um, the more that real they become, the more you'll see. Okay. Um, the next is the air element. It is an upside or is a facing up triangle with a line through it. And some representations are a feather and a theme, which is like a ceremonial blade and incense. Anything that you can smoke, like um, even cigars, like is very tied to like brujeria. 
um, which is particularly like South American witchcraft. Like that's particularly what they're called. Um, but like burning, you know, things like rosemary or even sage, those are air. Okay. And then last but not least is fire. So fire, you can have a cauldron on there, but usually a candle is like the best way to represent fire. Okay. Um, but you want to have something that represents them across the board. Now, I've already talked to you about the ancestral bloodline, so I won't get into that here. We'll talk about that more um, in our class live. But I hope that this has been helpful for you. I hope it creates some distinctions for you. And I hope that it prepares you for the work that we're going to be doing um, together. All right. I'll see you guys in um, our next offering. Bye.